Hi guys, this is Roy here, and today we are going to talk of from exactly where we left in the last lecture. So today is a part two of inferential, the last part of inferential statistics. So in the first part of inferential statistics, we talked about all those ideas about uh, probability distributive distribution functions, cumulative mass functions, cumulative density functions, probability mass function, probability density functions. We have talked about all of that, and we are very fairly comfortable with the idea of what is a random variable and the probability distribution that comes along with it so we know that if it's a random variable is a discrete variable then we have a probability mass function if it's a continuous variable we have a probability density function and at each point on the curve is basically showing the probability of what probability of that particular random variable as assuming that particular value right that's that's a um, that's the understanding of probability distribution function so at any point so let's to be just to be kind of clear about what we're talking about here so this is our probability say density function right so this was a normal distribution we have talked about it in case of normal distribution the probability density function gives you the probability that this particular random variable would assign this particular value right so say this particular value is a so probability of x equals to a is given by this particular value right so this particular and the similarly this is p say pdf where right? the corresponding value of cdf is something like this for normal distribution where what you're getting is probability of x equals to less than equals to a right so at each point at the same point a you're getting the probability of all the values which are less than equals to a right and then we this was the idea of cumulative density function right so you're summing up all the values of all the properties which are less than equals to a and this is basically nothing but the area of the graph till this point right so that is the concept of cumulative density function so now that's a that's a basic understanding that we already have so given that is a basic understanding now let's proceed to the understanding of this major thing that is called introduction to inference right so this is the most critical part of our inferential statistics and now let's talk about the most important part about uh, inferential statistics which is basically estimation of population from samples and that's the only thing that we are going to focus in this lecture today and that's the last part of inferential statistics and from next day onwards we start on machine learning as such so that's a good news so let's just stay on to the last part of inferential statistics lecture so now john's random experiment so john was already this guy if you remember he was looking at uh, 1460 prices right 1460 houses from across new york and then he was basically trying to allocate his fund right so john is curious to experiment with his data again he somehow thinks that 1460 is a lot of houses to look at so he needs to draw narrow down his search a bit so obviously as a normal human being looking at 1460 houses and all of the corresponding feature of all of those houses and looking at those numbers is extremely tough right you you imagine looking at 1400 1500 prices right 1500 houses and their data insane you can't do that so what he does is naive but he decides to just pick 500 houses at random so John is being a lazy guy as usual, um, not much of a surprise there. So John has been lazy like anything all throughout now. So he's extremely lazy now. He says that, hey, I think for looking at 1500 examples is tough. Let me just try and look at 500 of those places. And from those 500, let me deduce some things which I want to deduce, which I think should hold also equally well for the 1500 images, right? So what is the, what is this? concept that we are trying to get at is something that you already probably been able to guess but let's not get there let's complete the slides here so but then he has a feeling that these houses don't truly represent so this 500 houses that he would pick may not truly represent the prices and features of the house that he had selected a while ago right so problem with john is he knows that 1500 is a too much of a number to look at he wants to he's being lazy he wants to look at 500 but obviously as any lazy guy in the world he's kind of afraid that what if is this 500 image 500 houses that it chooses are not really representative of the 1500 images 1500 uh, houses right so in simple word he thought that these houses may be either be too expensive or too cheap as compared to the 500 right so basically this 500 that he has chosen might not represent his actual population his uh, 1500 houses correctly so the for example what he means is the mean of the 500 houses would be pretty far away from the mean of 1460 houses that he had calculated earlier right that could be possible right if he basically chooses his 500 houses which are extremely cheap houses 
uh, for some reason he ends up choosing 500 he probably might want to do random selection of those 500 houses but even if he for some reason he might end up with houses which are extremely cheap right so if he if he ends up basically choosing houses which are extremely cheap the mean of those houses would be extremely low than the 1400 right so if he tries to conclude anything right say about the price of houses using those 500 it could probably be an erroneous estimate as well right so john's first sample test so john tests the mean of 500 houses and compares it to 1460 houses so john what john has done is nothing but they build the concept of statistical inference in himself so statistical inference is this concept where you have an entire population and you are trying to take a sample from it and make some estimates about the population right so why is this even necessary because in reality all of us are lazy right for example if you want to do calculation based on census census is basically every people living in india 1.2 billion people right if you want to make calculation based on that many amount of people yeah it's it's tough what you want to do is probably select some 10,000 15,000 odd people ideally select them at random because you do not want to have any bias in selection as such once you select them you basically do calculate everything that you want to calculate about the population so you want to calculate daily income right or monthly income or daily uh, a number of people in the family all of those things that you want to calculate about the population you calculate on this small sample and then based on this calculation of sample you try and estimate what the population would be right so that's that's sim that's something that sounds very logical right because all of us are lazy we do not want to do calculation on the entire data set we want to take out a small sample do our calculation on that and based on our calculation if we basically try and estimate the same thing for population so we will calculate the daily say if you are trying to calculate monthly income of uh, mean of monthly income of all possible all the all the people in india right what is the average monthly income of an indian so what we'll do is basically select some 10000 people calculate their monthly mean monthly uh, income take the mean of those and based on that mean we can probably say hey i think if 10000 people of india on an average earn say 5000 rupees a day uh, 5000 rupees a month then probably average on an, on an average probably india as such every indian as such if you take the average of every indian uh, probably the entire population the average of the entire population should also come out to be somewhere around that right so that's 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 the philosophy behind doing sample using population inference using samples so in sample population inference or in search as such statistical inference you are always concerned about taking a small sample calculating the metric that you are interested in on that small sample and based on that you calculate the you predict the metric on the population right so what john does is basically calculate this small sample size of 500 so he takes this particular data and he predicts the sample mean the sample mean comes out to be 17749 which is 17749 and the sales price is 18000 uh sorry not 18000 180000 and that is 177000 right so that's a, that's a wide difference right so obviously that's something that is bothering so but we'll talk about it in a while so statistical inference is the process of making judgment about a population based on sampling properties we have already talked about that an important aspect of statistical inference is using estimates to approximate the value of an unknown population parameters so we are trying to infer or you can say estimate population parameters by using sample parameters so we calculate everything on a sample level and based on that we try and estimate things on a population level keep this in mind sample is basically a small sample taken out of the population so let's try and understand the concepts of the word sample and population as well this will be used a lot in statistics again let's build our intuition with help of some easy examples while analyzing data with statistical thinking we are often interested in the characteristics of some large large population but collecting data on the entire pop population may be infeasible for example leading up to u.s presidential election it would be useful to know the political leadings of every single eligible voter but serving every voter is not feasible right that's that's absolutely correct right not every voter would be inclined on kind of telling your opinion also it's just just physically in, impossible to kind of go and talk to all possible voters right so what you do is you obviously take a small sample of voters and based on their uh their uh leanings you would probably try and estimate what the population would overall would probably lean right 
So that's what you do instead. We could poll some subset of the population, such as thousand registered voters, and use that data to make inferences about the population as a whole. So this subset of the population is nothing but the sample. We carry out various tests on the sample to gain insight on the larger population out there. So statistical inference is the process of analyzing sample data to gain insight into population from which the data was collected and to investigate the difference between the data samples. So statistical inference, a parameter that is descriptive, is a descriptive. So what is a para thing that you're trying to measure of the po population is called a population parameter. A uh, population and or population parameter as such in general a parameter. So pa parameter is basically everything that is concerned with the population, right? So population mean, population variance, these are all parameters. And on the other hand, statistics. So statistic, statistic is the word. Statistic is basically everything that is co the corresponding uh, same. So if your if your population, if your parameter is population mean, statistic would be sample mean. Similarly, if your population is uh, if your parameter is population variance, your statistic would be sample variance, right? So the corresponding counterpart of parameter is statistic, right? So everything that you measure, so if you are measuring population mean, uh, that is your parameter, then the corresponding statistic for it is sample mean, right? And just to keep uh, this in mind, uh, there's this particular notation which I want you to kind of make note of, which is extremely important. Uh, if you are doing, uh, if you are for your rest of your course, rest of the curriculum as well, and as such also in general, you want to kind of keep this in mind. So whenever we're talking about this thing mu, mu is basically a population mean, and x bar is a sample mean, right? So that's the way we differentiate between statistic and parameter. Uh, similarly, uh, population standard deviation is sigma, and sample standard deviation is s. Right, so you have probably seen earlier before this lecture, especially in descriptive stats, we have used somewhere sigma, somewhere s, and that's perfectly fine. We have used x bar, mu, and all of that. But now that you know of this, you should not be using them interchangeably, right? You, now you know about this that population mean is always referred to as mu, and sample mean is referred to as x bar. Similarly, population standard deviation is defined as sigma, and standard deviation as sig s, and that's why population variance sigma population variance is sigma square and sample variance is s square. So now that we know what is so basically if you're trying to uh, estimate the parameter you use the statistic right so if you're estimating population mean you use sample mean if you're trying to uh, predict population variance you use sample variance if you're trying to predict population standard deviation you use sta sample standard deviation. So in John's case he is primarily concerned with the sales price of every house in Brooklyn Therefore, it's safe to assume that, 14, that John's 1460 house prices is a sample of the data, right? So John is basically trying to estimate everything about this particular, all the houses, estimate all prices and uh, you know features about all the houses in Brooklyn, right? So for him, basically, the population is all houses in Brooklyn, right? Of which 1460 is the sample that he has taken. But in for this particular that is a real life scenario but just for understanding of this course and this curriculum that is after this we would take 1460 as the houses which are the population and we'll take a sample of 500 from them that is for this particular case but in real life understand this that difference of sample and population could be not be so clear always right so there's a fine line which separates your sample and population so depending on what is your population your sample could change right so actually in real life 1460 houses are basically nothing but a sample of all the houses that are there in Brooklyn but in this particular case we are just gonna call those 1460 houses as population and the one that John selects 500 of them as our sample. So now we are gonna talk about a very important concept called central limit theorem. So what is a central limit theorem? So okay we will probably not even talk about central limit theorem first up. So before moving on to other concepts, let us understand, okay, so before we move on to understand what is central limit theorem, let's understand what is a sampling sampling distribution. So sampling distribution is nothing but a probability distribution. So understand that first. Sampling distribution is a probability distribution. A probability distribution, we remember again, look back at your inferential stats lecture. It could be a PMF or it could be a PDF depending on that variable is discrete or continuous. And it could, if it's a discrete variable, then there's a binomial distribution that you know of. If it's a continuous variable, then you know a normal distribution, right? So you remember that whole part of a probability distribution. So sampling distribution is nothing but a probability distribution of the statistic obtained by different drawing different samples of the population, right? 
so sampling distribution is nothing but you would instead of so you would have this 14 60 1500 houses right and every time you are taking 500 so now you if for example you take your 500 you take a sample 10 times of 500 samples each right so you are doing this experiment 10 times every time you are taking 500 samples you will get a mean right and then you would basically calculate the probability distribution of this particular mean uh, and that's the sampling distribution right you could calculate mean or you could calculate whatever standard deviation you could calculate variance whatever you want to calculate mode median whatever so every time what you're doing is you're taking samples and you're calculating that particular statistic you are again calculate taking a sample calculating the statistic remember you can what you're calculating is a sample level hence it's a statistic right so you're calculating the value of a statistics every time you're taking a sample and using that you're plotting the distribution of statistic right so sometimes the static mean could be i'll say 100 the mean could be 150 the mean could be 200 you have all of these possible values right so 10 different values if you would get if you do this experiment 10 times right 10 times you would pick up the samples you would write 10 different means using this 10 different means you are going to construct your curve so that is a sampling distribution so in this case let's compute this uh, sampling distribution so we have five watermelons that is our population and we have to randomly select two watermelons right and that is our sample so how would the sampling distributions of the mean of this particular uh, mean of the sample look like right so let's compute that so we are calculating the so there are these five watermelons we know the weights of those five watermelons now we are going to take two samples right and two samples and we are going to calculate what are the possible weights that we can what is the pos possible averages that we can get out of this sample samples right so these are your five five weights right three four two one point five and five so we calculate the population mean before we calculate anything else the so population means comes up to be 3.1 now let's look at all the possible samples right so we are gonna so there are two samples that we want to draw that we want to draw and there are five possible watermelons right so there are 10 possible combinations that can be possible so a b a c a d you can see here all the 10 combinations being written out and we have the corresponding weight for them 3 comma 4 and you can see the sample mean right and the sample mean for each of the weight is 1 by 10 right because none of the weights basically get repeated more than once if say there were be two weights which had been 3.5 then the probability of 3.5 would be 2 by 10 right because in this case each of the weight is being repeated just once that's why probability of each of them is 1 by 10 if for any as i said if for any reason one of these weights were repeated multiple times the probabilities would be different right so this table that we have derived is nothing but a sampling distribution of the mean right sample mean so there are 10 possible combinations and we have taken all these combinations and we have drawn out the population right and hence we can see that none of the samples selected gives us values identical to the true mean of the population right which is something we have kind of realized here that happened whatever sample we may select the true mean was 3.1 none of the samples that we take actually is 3.1 which is kind of obvious right if we take samples we are not expected to get the real value we are only can get an estimate of the real value we cannot really get the real value so what we get is basically the different values now we can calculate the mean of the above derived sample distribution right so understand this what we are now doing is calculating a mean of all the sample means right so you have got five watermelons out here and what we are going to do is we are going to take two of them at a time and calculate the mean of weights so for each two of them we calculate the mean right so this is now my sampling mean sample mean right and we have the corresponding probability for each of them so now what we can do is we can plot them and they would come out to be something like this right so there would be a lot of values around here and we can basically get the probability distribution the same probability for each of those weights is same right so this is how the distribution would look like right and you can take the mean of this particular distribution right so this is a sample means and you can see how the sample means are distributed right so 
now if you probably this looks like something like this right so there's a it looks like an uniform distribution right so all the pro all the values have equal probabilities right and there's a value these are values close to each other and that's about it so these are all the values now if you take so this is a distribution right so you understand this is a probability distribution and we have talked about this earlier as well because this is a probability distribution you can calculate the mean of this distribution itself keep in mind we are calculating the mean of distribution of sample means so we first take sample means these are your sample means and you have the corresponding probabilities for each of them now you are taking the mean of the sample means right so that particular value let's now do this so we are taking the samples and we have got the, all the sample means and the mean of those sample means come out to be exactly 3.1 which is not absolutely stunning right because we have taken all the means these are all possible values and we take a mean of that it comes out to be 3.1 so thus we can see that although the mean of individual samples did not give us a correct value the mean of sample means gave us the exact value right so that is quite something that is something that we take back from here and this is exactly what your central limit theorem is going to talk about so central limit theorem says that uh, given sufficiently large sample sizes right so if we have enough so in this case we took two samples out of five right so let's not talk about two but if the sample sizes are extremely high normally greater than 30 if you have greater than 30 sample sizes then what happens is if you take a lot of you take sampling distributions like this then the mean of your standard so if you take a lot of samples right uh, then your mean of the samples from the sample population from the same population will be approximately equal to the mean of the population right so let's now talk about say thousand more than 10,000 samples right so now this sample says 10,000 watermelons right and we obviously if we take two of them there are probably absolutely insane number of possible combinations right so we probably don't want to do that so instead of two if we say, say take sufficiently large number say 100 right even with 100 there can be so many possible combinations right so if we take 100 and there are so many possible we do not want to take all of them but if we take 100 and we take enough number of samples right so then this and we calculate the mean right so we calculate the mean which is sorry not that sorry this is so we calculate the mean which is x bar right calculate the mean x bar of each of these samples then the corresponding mean of this particular distribution would basically be equals to mu right so that's exactly what your central limit theorem says if you take a lot of these samples you need not take all possible combination that's the only thing to keep in mind if you would obviously take all the possible combination it would come out to be exactly mu but if you take not even all possible combination but you take sufficiently large samples and you take say around 15 or 20 or say another 100 combinations right 100 samples and then basically and you take the mean of each of this 100 samples right so this is your sample 1 this is sample 2 this is sample 3 sample 4 and so on if you take the corresponding mean of each of the samples and then you basically take a mean of the sample means that would probably be roughly equal to your population mean right the same thing that we have done here right the same thing that we did with the watermelon uh, so that is the first the first postulate of central limit theorem the second thing is which it says is if you take this means ideally this means the sample means would basically follow a distribution like this which is a normal distribution the normal distribution would be having mean as your population mean right so it says that if you take all of the samples right 100 such samples right from each of those 100 samples you have calculated the sample mean now you are plotting the probability distribution of those sample means right keep in mind so sample means the probability distribution of sample means would basically follow a normal distribution with the mean being mu and the standard deviation being sigma by root n right so where n is your total your sample size right so in this case n equals to 100 right so if you if you basically take uh, uh, samples of 100 and you take the sample mean this and the sample mean would basically follow a normal curve like this with the mean at mu mu is your population mean keep that in mind and your standard deviation is population standard deviation sigma 
by root of n. So that is what exactly your central limit theorem says. And uh, according to central limit theorem, so that's the first point. The second point is according to central limit theorem, the mean of the sample of data would be closer to mean of overall population in question as the sample size increases. Obviously, if you're if you're instead of taking hundred, if you take thousand sample size is a thousand then and you do this this would be more closer to um, normal distribution right so what central limit of theorem also says is that as your basically number of sample size increases this tends to get more closer to mu right so if you just take sample sizes of 10 and do this calculation uh, well that would be close to mu but not as close as probably it would be when if you take instead of 10 if you take thousand samples right then it would be probably be the mean of this samples would be even more closer to mu right so similarly so that, that's the understanding of central limit theorem so overall central limit theorem summarily says this as your sample size increases your sampling the sam mean of your sample would basically come more and more closer to your population mean and it would tend to become more and more normally distributed with the normal distribution parameters being if you if you remember from last lecture normal distribution can be defined only by two parameters right so as central limit theorem says as your number of sample size increases your obvious one thing is your samples mean becomes closer to popular mean uh, population mean right the mean of your sample means comes closer to your sample uh, population mean the other thing it says is uh, the sample means that you have calculated would basically become more and more closer to a perfect normal distribution right uh, with the means with parameters mu and sigma y root n so assumption of this central limit theorem the assumption that the data is from a normal distribution simplifies matter but seems a bit unrealistic right so suddenly why would the sample mean basically follow a normal distribution right so that's something so just a little real world data shows that outliers, skewness, multiple peaks and asymmetry show up quite routinely for the one like the one John had encountered in the sales price above, right? So in his previous lecture, if you remember, we in the in descriptive stats part, we had talked about how all of this kind of comes up and then the sales price was not exactly like a normal distribution. So we can get around the problem of data from a population that is not normal. The use of an appropriate sample size and central limit theorem help us to get around the problem of data from populations that are not normal. So this is the beauty of central limit theorem. So the beauty of central limit theorem is that it says that even if your data is not from a normal distribution, it could be from exponential distribution, it could be from any distribution. We really don't care. If your data is from any goddamn distribution, but if you take samples and you take the mean of those samples, the mean of those samples would basically follow a normal distribution always. And it will become closer and closer to your population distribution as the sample size increases and it becomes closer to a perfect normal distribution that is what the beauty of central limit theorem your your actual distribution could be any kind of distribution as long as the the number of sample sizes are extremely high not like extremely high but greater than 30 that's what we talked about right so if your number of sample size is greater than 30 and you're estimating the mean then it doesn't matter if your sample sizes become better and better your pop sam your mean of your sample means would basically become more and more closer to population mean and it would tend to the mean of sample the sample means would basically follow a normal distribution so now this is something that we can explain using and this we can basically see in this particular distribution what we do here is we take three three basically distributions so one is a flat distribution, the other one is an exponential distribution, the other one is a beta distribution, right? And what we do is from each of these samples, we from each of this distribution, what we do is we basically uh, take thousand, we take samples. Uh, so now this is something that we can also see graphically in this case. So what we do here is we take three, three possible uh, non-normal distributions, right? So one is a flat distribution, which is like a uniform distribution. Then there's an exponential distribution, there's a beta distribution. And what we do is we basically take, uh, we take uh, samples, right? So samples of size one, size two, size three, size five, size 10, 100 and 200, right? So this is on your X axis. So sorry, Y axis. On your Y axis, you have basically the different sample sizes. 
and then what we do is we calculate uh, we calculate the sample mean distribution right taking doing this experiment thousand times right so that's what we have yeah so we basically in the first case for example to explain you what we do here is for example in this particular n equals to 2 and flat so what we do is we take sample sizes of 2 we do that thousand times from this particular distribution and we plot the corresponding distribution of sample means right so this histogram that you see is basically the distribution of sample means right uh, drawn from a flat distribution and this is the case when the actual data the population data is basically an exponential distribution the population data in this case is a flat distribution the population data is a beta distribution remember this the population distribution is just anything right we really don't care about it and what we do is we take basically in this case n equals to 2 we take sample sizes of 2 and we take 1000 times sample sizes of 2 again here we take sample sizes of 1000 times we take sample sizes of 2 and again we do a 1000 times sample sizes of 2 and we do calculate the sample mean and then try and plot the normal distribution that central limit theorem says it should follow right and central limit theorem says that it should follow this normal distribution with mu and sigma by root n so from the population distribution we can calculate its mu mean and its uh, sigma by root n and this yellow curve is basically the the standard the normal distribution that central limit theorem says it should follow right and now what is an interesting thing you can see here is this as the sample size kind of increases so on and so forth you basically see that it becomes more and more a normal like distribution right so at n equals to 200 it's a perfect normal distribution in all the three cases the three cases being absolutely non-normal distributions right so we do not really do not care whether the actual distribution was normal or non-normal in this case if you do this calculation so what we see is this yellow line is a predicted uh predicted normal distribution right so remember the predicted normal distribution was normal distribution with mean equals to mu and standard deviation is sigma by root n where n is the sample size so we do that yellow line and you see that the yellow line and the sampling distribution match absolutely perfectly in case of n equals to 200 and as your basically sample size is increases it starts to it starts getting better and better right the matching is almost complete so that is what your central limit theorem says right so this blue lines are basically the mean the distribution of the means right and the distribution of means become more and more normal perfect like normal as your sample sizes kind of increases and uh, they are being distributed and the mean of all of the sample mean is basically the population mean right so that's that's the understanding behind central limit theorem so the width of the gaussian distribution is same as the original parent distribution the width of the gaussian distribution scales as so the mean is same as the population mean the variance is one by root n so statistical estimation now is the, con the next concept we are talking about is statistical estimator so st estimator is basically a statistical parameter that provides the estimation of population parameter a point estimator is a single value that estimates the population parameter an interval estimator is a conf co confidence interval gives a range of values for the population mean so suppose we have a population of 1000 people attending an event and we want to find the average age of the audience so point estimate is something where we just give a direct estimate right so there's no there's no range of values associated we just say that this is the estimate so mean age of the audience is 25 years and an interval estimate would be something like mean age of the audience is between 22 and 28 years right so you are not absolutely sure about your values so the concept is simple right if you are using population and you're taking a sample out of it one way is directly say hey i think whatever is the estimate of the sample is the same thing that would apply to population the other thing is Hey, I have drawn a sample. I'm not very sure how well this would kind of correspond to population. So let me do one thing. I think the actual population value would be the sample thing that I've measured plus minus some error possibility of error, right? So plus minus there's some error. Uh, there's some value that you would want to accommodate for error, right? So that is your interval estimate. So point estimates, as I said, so sample mean x bar is a point, po po point estimate of your population mean. And s equals to sigma by root n is a point estimate of your population variance, right? So if you want to calculate your, uh, if your population mean, what you would do is you just take the sample mean and say, hey, 
I I think if I'm doing a point estimate, my sample mean is exactly my population mean. Log on to Grey Atoms Learning Platform to unlock more free content. Subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon for regular updates.